What's up everybody? So you guys have been asking me to make a video on regulation of gene expression because it's part of the whole transcription translation topic, right? Now it's not such a nice topic, but I'm going to try and make, make it very nice for you guys so it makes complete sense. Now, so here we are. The day has come. Now let's just start by looking at this guy. You guys, maybe you don't know him. If you like MMA, you'll know him. He's an MMA fighter and his name is Paddy the Batty Pimblet. And this guy is a human, right? Hopefully, just like us, he's a human. And humans are very, 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 very diverse, right? We got skin cells, we got heart cells. We're made up of billions of cells and a lot of them are different from each other. Now, this is, bear this idea in mind, right? So we have many different kinds of cells that make up different parts of our body. Now, cell, so here's a cell. So we're made up of many of these, right? And they can be different. But my question to is, well, I'm gonna tell you something and you're gonna think about it. Our cells, every single one of our billions of cells have the exact same DNA inside the nucleus, right? This is the nucleus. The exact same DNA is there. DNA is an instruction manual. When you make a, when you make a, a meal and there's a recipe, you're going to follow the recipe and make that meal. If I give this recipe to hundreds of people, they will all make the same product. They'll all make the same food. Now, the cell has this DNA, this instruction manual, and all of the cells have the same instruction manual. So why don't all the cells in our body look exactly the same? Why aren't we, uh, why aren't human beings a big blob of identical cells? Why are we so diverse? Why do we have so many different kinds of cells? Why do we look so complex if all our cells have the exact same DNA? In very short terms, the answer is different cells only read a different part of the DNA. So for example, some cells will only read a small section of the DNA and that small section will tell them to become skin cells, whereas other cells will read another section and that section will tell them how to become muscle cells. So that's how our cells are different. In fact, they have all the same DNA, but they don't all read all the DNA. They only read a small part and the rest they ignore. And we're gonna see a little bit about how that works. But so that's the answer. They all have the same DNA, but they decide to ignore some of it. It's the same thing as you, as your parents giving you instructions and you deciding to ignore 90% of it and just listen to the last part. You're going to get um, a different response. Then you're going to do something different than your other brother who's going to do the first part and ignore the rest, right? So bear this in mind. That's why our cells are different. So first, what is this again? Just tell me what this part is. This is your nucleus, right? So this is where our DNA is stored. Our DNA is super, super long. Bear this in mind. So our DNA is a freaking long string. Very, very long. Very, very insanely long. You have no idea. Now, the only way it can fit in this teeny tiny cell, never mind the nucleus, so to fit in this nucleus, right, it's got a super coil. So if we have our DNA string, it's got to wind up so tight, so tight until it forms a chromosome that can actually fit inside these nu the nucleus. You have like 23 of these chromosomes, right? Okay, I already told you this. So my question to you is then, I just told you the vague answer, why cells are different and why identical twins can be slightly different because identical twins have the same exact DNA. So why two twins that have the same DNA, why can one have big muscles, the other one small muscles? Why can certain things change even though they have the same DNA? So we're gonna go a little bit into that and try and get a bigger understanding of how this whole transcription and gene expression is regulated. Okay, so like I said, we have cells. Now the cells have the DNA. The DNA is instructions um, for certain proteins, right? Proteins are like we read, our, our cells will read the DNA, a specific part, and this specific part will tell them how to make a certain protein. And this protein will have a certain function, right? So the process of reading this, this specific part of DNA and turning it into a protein is called transcription and translation. Transcription will turn the DNA into an mRNA, this specific part, because you're not gonna transcribe the whole DNA, like I said, right? Each cell will only do a small part of the DNA. So this specific part, you're gonna transcribe it, and in, in, in this happens inside the nucleus, into an mRNA. Then this mRNA is gonna get um, converted into this final protein in translation. So this whole process, transcription and translation, I made a whole video on this whole thing, so you can check that out for that to make sense. I'm just summarizing. Now, this translation part happens in the cytoplasm, so this bluish part, outside of the nucleus. Okay, so that's just a vague overview of 
the whole transcription translation thing. Now, this is in reality how DNA looks like, right? We all know that now. Based on DNA structure video and looking at transcription translation, we know it's this double helix thing with all these bases connecting to each other and blah, it's pretty complicated. Now, for the sake of this video, we're going to pretend DNA is just a straight line like this, just to um, kind of understand the whole regulation part so it doesn't have to look so complicated. But we know just when I'm using this, know that it actually looks like that. Just for now, it's going to be simplified. So how can we control our gene expression? I just told you that some cells only, only, well, okay, first, let's not get ahead of ourselves. What is gene expression? Gene expression, in the most simple terms that I can think of, is essentially the process of doing what the DNA says. So how can we control what the DNA says? The DNA is telling us so many things. So each cell has all the DNA and the DNA is telling it to do this, do that, become this, become that. But it cannot do everything. Otherwise it would be able, otherwise it would have to be every single cell in our body at the same time. And that's impossible. It can only be one. It can only do some things at this at once. So gene expression is basically contr um, um, control of gene expression is basically the process of our body making sure that each cell only expresses some genes, not all of them, only reads and does what some genes say and not all of them, okay? Do you understand what I mean? So our body does this through some mechanisms. Our body controls what genes our cells actually reads and actually carries out, okay? Our body controls that so that all the cells don't do everything the whole time. So specifically, we're going to be talking about eukaryotes because eukaryotes, that's what we are. That's like humans, animals, plants, anything like that, that has a cell with a nucleus, basically any kind of organism with a cell like this. You, um, you probably know by now the difference between prokaryotes and eukaryotes. And if you don't, you can just check the video that I made before on this. Okay, so, so eukaryotes, we're not talking about prokaryotes, we're talking about us, humans, animals, all those things. So there are two ways that we can regulate this gene expression, regulating the process of turning a gene into a protein, okay? Two, transcriptional regulation. So some mechanisms that can regulate transcription, right? Which is this first part, turning the DNA into an mRNA. There's some mechanisms that can control this. Then there's um, two mechanisms, nucleosomes and binding proteins. We'll talk about these. And then there's post-transcriptional regulation. So that is some kind of regulation that happens around here, after transcription, but before translation. So mechanisms that alter this mRNA. And we'll see exactly what I mean. So don't, don't worry if you're confused right now. This is kind of just like trying to give you a summary of what we're going to talk about. So let's talk about the first one. So controlling gene expression in transcription. So how, are, how is gene expression, again, the process of turning this gene into a protein, um, regulated? So one is nucleosomes. So if we look back here at this, right, nucleosome, what is nucleosome? We know when, I take it, when you take our DNA and we wind it up, we have to wrap it around these histones, these pink molecules, to make it very, very nice, compact, and all that. The combination of the DNA and these histones, that's called the nucleosome. And you'll have many of these nucleosomes. And these nucleosomes will wrap around each other and all that. Now, when we wrap them so tightly, guess what? We're kind of hiding a lot of the DNA. We're hiding the DNA because everything is so tightly packed. So the problem is when you hide DNA, then it's very difficult for um, your bodies, for all the, the molecules to access the particular part of DNA that they want to transcribe, that they want to turn into a protein, right? Because in reality, if they're all tightly wrapped and you cannot find any of them, they cannot be accessed and then we cannot transcribe them. So nucleosomes are very important because they can decide what DNA is free and which ones are not. So if nucleosomes can wrap very tightly, um, hiding all of the DNA, or they can be more loose like this and free some DNA. And when the DNA is freed like this, they become accessible. And so all the molecules that do transcription can reach them and carry out the process. So that's why um, it's important. Because if nucleosomes are, um, uh, are, are like, nucle nucleosomes can prevent transcription by doing this, look. So here we can see the nucleosomes let go of some DNA, making them free, accessible, but they can also wind up very tightly and make the DNA inaccessible. And so your genes cannot be transcribed. So for example, if we go back to this idea here, um, so say you have this your long piece of DNA and you have a cell, um, 
most of the DNA will be in this form. It will be hidden, very tightly packed, not be able to be transcribed. Um, and at any given moment, a very small amount may be free so that it can be transcribed. In this way, only some parts of the DNA is being transcribed, the parts that are needed in that moment, the proteins that are needed in that moment, because all the other ones are not needed. So they're going to be hidden so that they cannot be transcribed, right? So that's a big idea with the whole nucleosomes one. They can make DNA accessible or not. So this is one way in which gene expression is regulated in transcription, right? Because transcription will take this DNA and make it an mRNA, which will become a protein. So by regulating which a gene DNA is accessible, you're regulating transcription and therefore gene expression. Now, here's some words. I put it in word form just for you to see. So DNA can be supercoiled into structures called nucleosomes. When supercoiled, all the molecules that do transcription, like RNA polymerase and other things, cannot access the DNA, and therefore we cannot do transcription. Therefore, that gene will not be used. It will just sit there, right? So nucleosomes are important because they can either inhibit or permit transcription by controlling whether the necessary molecules can bind to DNA, right? So this is the word form of what I pretty much just explained. Now, here we go on to the next one. So we just finished one. We finished this part, if I go back here. So transcriptional regulation, we talk now about nucleosomes. We're going to talk now about binding proteins. So if we remember how I said, this is just DNA, okay? This is the simplified form of DNA. I told you back there, we're going to make DNA very nice and simple. Now, DNA has different segments, which we can give different names, okay? So there is this, um, so with this highlighted section here, let's say this is the gene that we want to transcribe. This is the gene that we need. The body right now wants this gene to become a protein because we need this protein for some reason, okay? Now, the section right before the target gene, so the section right prior to this target DNA that we want to transcribe is called the promoter, the promoter. This is where all the molecules are going to bind to that will initiate the transcription of this gene. So the molecules like RNA polymerase and all that, they don't bind to the target gene. They bind to the section right before the target gene, and then they transcribe the target gene. They, then they go along and transcribe the target gene. So promoter, what happens at the promoter? At the promoter, we're going to have this happen. We need RNA polymerase. That's one molecule. Okay. We also need other things. So RNA polymerase is not enough, okay? That's, this makes sense. Why does this make sense? So if, our D, if, if we have our, our cell, right, and our DNA is floating free, okay, let's say they're floating free, that means at any given moment, all our DNA can just be transcribed as long as there's RNA polymerase because RNA polymerase is pretty much always there. It's always there. So if our genes are free, then RNA polymerase will just transcribe everything and will make so many proteins that we don't even need. So it's important that we have another molecule that's going to regulate this. So without, without, without this other molecule, this process cannot start. Okay, we also need this other molecule. And this other molecule is called transcription factors. Let me show you. It's like little, it's a bunch of molecules that are just part of it. They go to the promoter region. Okay, and they're going to bind there. Just like this. Just like the RNA polymerase. Once they are there, we call them transcription factors because they are factors that are going to be very important in transcription. Now, with the transcription factors there, the RNA polymerase there at the promoter region, now we can transcribe this target gene. Okay, now, important to understand, different genes have different transcription factors. So this, let's say this transcription factor was made because now we need to transcribe this gene. So your body decided to make this uh, transcription factor. So now this transcription factor came into the cell and came here to allow this gene to be made. So if it was another one, it would go to another promoter region to make another uh, gene be made. So transcript there. Are, so you have to understand that there are many different kinds of transcription factors, and they and they will go to different genes. They are involved in allowing different genes to be made. Okay, transcription factors. Not only this though. So it's more complicated than that. So this, this is good. This can allow target gene transcription, but there's another thing that can enhance it even more. So say all of these things are there, you can make this target gene, but there is another thing that can enhance it, make it happen even more, make this target gene be turned into a protein even more. 
So what do I mean by this? There are other kinds of transcription factors, okay? So we can call this one here general transcription factors. They go to the promoter region. Then there's other kinds of trans transcription factors, also known as activators, that goes to another region pretty, pretty far from the target gene. So it's not close like the promoter. It's rather far down the DNA. And this enhancer region will also bind transcription factors. And again, these trans transcription factors will be specific for this target gene, right? Because we want to activate this target gene. So let's say there's a bunch of transcription factors that come in. They bind to this enhancer. Let's say like this. Um, now, once, this, once they bind to this enhancer, they're going to cause a shape change. A shape change. What do I mean? Like this image. So notice we have the promoter region here with our transcription factor, our RNA polymerase, about to transcribe this target gene. But we want to enhance it. We want to make it even more. So these, act, uh, these other transcription factors go bind to a region called the enhancer region. Once they bind to it, it causes these binding proteins to cause this DNA to change shape, causing it to bend. This bending causes this enhancer region to become into contact with this initiation complex. So we call this the initiation complex, the combination of this RNA polymerase, the promoter, and these transcription factors ready to transcribe this gene. That's the initiation complex. So the binding of these, of these transcription factors to this enhancer causes these binding proteins to get the enhancer region close to stimulate this initiation complex even more. So it's basically an enhancer. It enhances transcription of this target gene so we can make even more of it. Okay, do you understand that? So I'll put now some words that's basically going to summarize what I pretty much just said. Okay, um, I'm not going to read it, but it's pretty much what I just said. So what this does, what these two things do, remember we, we talked now about nucleosomes that regulate which genes are accessible. And then we talked about these binding proteins. All of these are just binding proteins. They bind to these things. Um, we talked about how they can regulate this target gene transcription without these binding proteins, even if, even if this DNA is free, without these binding proteins, this gene will not be transcribed. So even if the nucleosomes allow the DNA to be accessible to be transcribed, if the binding proteins aren't there, if these transcription factors aren't there, then this target gene will not be made, okay? So this is another way in which um, gene expression is regulated in transcription with these binding proteins. But if these nucleosomes make this DNA accessible and there's these transcription factors and this RNA polymerase at the promoter region and we have these other transcription factors causing this enhanced complex to become closer, then we're going to make so much of this target gene to be able to have it for whatever function we need it. Because this target gene can have any kind of function depending what gene it is, right? So that's it for these two now. So we talked about gene expression in transcription. Now after transcription, so let's say we made now, let's go back here. Let's say we successfully completed now the making of this um, mRNA. Because we just talked about how this transcription process can be regulated with nucleosomes and binding proteins, right? But let's say we've gone through that process now, we did that regulation, and we may finally made this protein that our body really needs. I mean this mRNA that our body need, really needs. How else can this mRNA be regulated? Let's go, let's go look at it. So if we go back here, we're basically going to talk about, um, sorry, this, we finish now these two, transcriptional regulation. We're going to talk now about post-transcriptional. Post means after. So we're going to talk about regulation after transcription happened. Oh yeah, wait, I actually forgot one thing. Um, you may ask me now, okay man, I understand that these transcription factors are here, but where do they come from? Why, why would they suddenly just be there? Why would they suddenly be there to activate this target gene? Where, what causes them to come? What causes these activators, these transcription factors to appear out of nowhere? I wanna give you an example. So if we have a cell here, this is our cell, and this is our um, nucleus, so let's say this. We have a little part called a receptor. That's this, this basically little molecule on the cell membrane that binds stuff. It like, it captures messages. It's like a mailbox, okay? So let's say we have a muscle cell, okay? A muscle cell. Now our muscle cell, say we're using, there's a guy using his muscles a lot. He's lifting weights. 
By lifting your muscles, you damage them a bit. So you're going to release some molecules. You're going to release some molecules in the process, okay, that uh, as a consequence of lifting and causing damage to them. This molecule will travel to this muscle cell and it will bind to a receptor. And this receptor, so it's like a mailbox, will then read this, uh, this molecule and say, oh, okay, I got to make something. So in response to that molecule, this receptor is going to make a molecule, a transcription factor. Okay, it's going to make a transcription factor. Basically, trans, um, send, transferring this, this, this molecule signal into another molecule. So we call this a transcription factor. Now, this transcription factor is here because um, another cell got damaged. So this is a sign that muscles are being used, in a, in a sense. In a sense, this is showing that muscles are being used. So in our DNA, we obviously have some genes that are going to make our muscles stronger, to make more, bigger muscles. So this transcription factor has a job because it appears when your muscles get damaged. So it's going to go to the DNA and go to a gene specifically like this, right? If I go back here, it's going to go to an enhancer region or a promoter region of a gene that it belongs to. So let's say this one belongs to a gene that's going to make bigger muscles. So it's going to go to that gene, bind to the enhancer or the promoter region and cause what? more transcription. If we have more transcription of this gene, we're going to have more proteins. And this protein will, for example, make your muscles stronger, make them bigger so that they don't get damaged so, so easily next time. So you can get bigger muscles. That's what happens when you lift weights, right? So if I put this into word form, it'll be like this. Okay. So you can read that. So that's just, I just wanted to show you where these molecules come from, why they just appear out of nowhere. They appear uh, um, as a consequence of something happening in your body, indicating that you need a protein, indicating that there's something you need. And then that molecule makes sure that you get more of that certain thing. Okay. Now we can go on to the post transcriptional modification. So now we have our mRNA, right? So this is what's formed after transcription. Now our mRNA has a, um, a lot of, um, uh, what do you call it? RNA molecules, right? So um, the nucleotides, right? Now, not all of these, not the whole mRNA is going to become a protein. Some of it codes for nothing. Some of it, some of it is useless. So there's different segments. We can call some introns and some exons. So exons are parts of the mRNA that will code for amino acids. So this will code for a certain part of the protein. So you can see here exon 1, exon 2, exon 3. These will all code for proteins, for amino acids, right? But introns don't code for anything. They are um, kind of like in the way. They don't really do anything. So what's going to happen is this. Our body is going to have mechanisms of doing splicing. Splicing is the process of removing the introns. Okay, so let me show you what can happen. So let's say our body can then decide to do some splicing. By the way, this is still happening in the nucleus, right? Because we know here um, in the nucleus, we transcription forms mRNA. Before mRNA leaves the nucleus, it has to do this kind of splicing thing that I'm talking about now. So splicing. So what can we form? If we remove all of the introns, right? I said introns are non-coding regions. They are there, but... They don't have a job, so your body needs to modify and remove these, okay? And we'll see why this is important. But so it's going to remove these introns. So what can we form? If we remove all introns, intron 1, 2, and 3, what are we going to have? We will have what? Let's say this. We can have this. Maybe let's put it here. We can have uh, exon 1, exon 2, exon 3. So this is now a mature mRNA. So we can call this an immature mRNA, this one here it's not finished yet. It's not the final mRNA. And we can call this one the mature mRNA. This one will now do translation to become a protein. What else can happen? What if we remove all the introns, but also one of the exons? Because the introns are always removed in splicing, but sometimes the exons can also be removed. So let's say we remove all the introns and also exon 3. Then we're going to get this. What if we remove all the introns and remove exon 2, then we're going to get this. So it shows here that we can get different variations of the mature mRNA. Okay, so this one here, let's say this one will go and make protein A. This one here will go make protein B. This one here will go make protein C. 
So these are all slightly different, right? So splicing can make different variations of the mature mRNA. So we can put it here. These are still mRNA, but these can be slightly different. So because they are slightly different, they will make slightly different proteins. And because they make slightly different proteins, that will have slightly different functions. So for example, let's say, so what I'm basically trying to say is um, one gene, one gene can make many different proteins, many different variations of the same protein. So let's say this gene was supposed to make, let's say, tropomyosin. This is something you learn about in the muscle unit. This is a molecule involved in your muscle contraction. So let's say there's a gene coding for this protein. This gene can, in theory, make many different versions of this protein, so many different types of protomyosin based on the, what happens with splicing. And this, this makes sense because we have different kinds of muscles in our body. We have smooth muscles, cardiac muscles, and skeletal muscles. Skeletal muscles is the ones we can move, think about, your arm muscles, all that. Smooth muscles are in your gut. They, may, they move your food along without you thinking about it. And then we have cardiac muscles, which is in your heart, your heart contracting. You don't even think about that either. All of those have slightly different muscles. And um, it makes sense because this gene can make slightly different proteins. And so let's say protein A might be one for your cardiac muscle, whereas protein B might be a tropomyosin for your skeletal muscle, right? So this is why it's important. You need to understand that one gene can make many different proteins, many different variations of the same protein. So this is another way in which our, um, our gene expression can be modified, okay? This is another way, splicing. So let me give you a small tip here for you to remember. So exons are expressed. They will become the protein, okay? They will become, they will be, they will be expressed, whereas introns, they call it, they're intervening. They're going to get removed, okay? They will be uh, removed with splicing. So here I have some words, again, of basically what I just said, um, if you want to read that. Okay, so what did we just cover? We covered now two ways in which gene expression can be regulated two ways in which our body controls what proteins are made, what DNA is used, okay? So we can think about two big categories, transcriptional regulation, which included the nucleosomes and binding proteins. These two influenced which genes are transcribed. And then we have this post-transcriptional regulation, which influences what happens to the, in, uh, what happens to the immature mRNA for it to become a mature mRNA. So that can also produce different proteins, as we just saw. All of these are ways in which our gene expression is regulated. Okay, now, now we're going to talk about how the environment, this is very interesting, actually, how the environment affects our gene expression. So, for example, um, say, say you have a certain gene set, okay? How can the environment affect the way your genes are expressed? Okay, how can that be? Let me show you. Just being a different gender can affect. So say there's a girl and a guy, and they have the same genes. Okay, they have, they have the same gene. How can gender affect it? Let me show you. So there's a gene in both male and female, the same gene. Okay, this gene is for male baldness. Okay, it's known as the male baldness gene. And basically, this gene is in both males and females. But males affect it more. Let me show you what I mean. So this gene, it... Um, if it is activated, it causes you to go bald, okay? So both males and females have it. So why don't both male and females get bald the same? Males get bald more. Why is that? That's because there's an environmental thing that can, uh, that can affect this gene expression. Um, and this environmental thing is your gender. It's a molecule, which I'll show you now. So males guess what we make testosterone right it's what makes you a man it makes you have a deep voice it's what makes your reproductive system develop it's what makes you angry all of these things right testosterone females have less testosterone than males now testosterone is this environmental thing it's a molecule it's a thing that comes not from the dna but somewhere else so this testosterone is going to go to the dna and tell it to be expressed it's going to stimulate expression of this gene so because males have more testosterone, more testosterone is going to stimulate this gene more than in females. And so males are more prone to have male baldness than female. Females do not have, uh, have this as much. And it's actually proven because sometimes during stressful events, females make more testosterone than usual. 
and it's been noticed during those times when they make more testosterone, they also exhibit um, male baldness and they get bald more quickly than normal, okay? So this is one example of how an environmental thing can affect gene expression. Now, let's look at this one. Drugs. So there's a drug called thalidomide, okay? Uh, it was used about 70 years ago. It's not used anymore, and you'll see precisely why it's not used anymore. So this drug was used to, um, when women, they're pregnant, when they're pregnant, they use this drug called th uh, thalidomide uh, when they have morning sickness. So when you're pregnant, you, have, you sometimes get morning sickness. And so they take this drug, which will go to this gene, um, uh, which will have its effect. It will make the person feel better, but it will have another effect. It will affect gene expression. So it will go to the baby. Okay, so remember the mother's pregnant. So not only can these drugs affect her um, to feel better, but they can also go to the baby. So when they go to the baby, it goes to the baby's DNA. And it basically inhibits the expression of the baby's DNA. And that's very bad because we, the baby needs to express its genes so that it can form and develop limbs and become... Um, uh, a, a proper full-grown baby, right? So then what happens is this. The fetus malforms because its DNA has been inhibited as it was uh, during pregnancy. So what happens is something called phocomelia. Notice the babies, their limbs do not form properly. Um, so you can see they're very short and they are non-functional. They don't even work. So this is another way showing how the environment, something in the environment, a drug, can affect the way your genes are expressed. Because in this case, the drug inhibits the expression of genes and therefore inhibits the formation of proper development. Now, one last one is temperature. This one is the funniest one for me, to be honest. Look at this rabbit. Notice the colors, right? Some, it's, it's white, but in some spots, black. Hmm. This is very interesting, actually. So look, in a rabbit, in this rabbit, these are called Himalayan rabbits. They have a gene, okay? Somewhere in their DNA, they have this gene. This gene codes for black fur, okay? Black fur. So when this gene is activated, it's gonna make the, the bunny black, okay? Whatever cells, if the cells are activated, um, it will make that part black. So in very warm conditions, so let's say more than 35 degrees, okay, when it's warm, then this gene is inactivated, and so the bunny will be white. But when it is below 35, this gene will be activated and it will become black. So guess what this means? The ears, the nose, and the feet are areas that get cold first. It makes sense. Go outside when it's freaking cold. Your toes are going to freeze off. Your fingers are going to freeze off. Your nose and your ears, right? That's, those are the parts that get cold first. So because these part gets cold first, the cells in the ear, the cells in the nose, the cells in the hand and the feet will be colder. And because they are colder, this will activate this gene. This gene is influenced by temperature. So when it is cold, this gene is activated. And so these areas will express this gene. And this gene makes these uh, makes the hair here be black. Okay, so that's very interesting. So overall from this, we can see that there not only can our um, genes be controlled, so we go back to this, not only can our genes gene expression be controlled by natural ways that everybody has, but also the environment. Our, um, the environment can affect our gene expression. Things in the environment like testosterone, like drugs, like temperature. Okay, so that's very important to bear in mind. Now, the ultimate thing we need to talk about is epigenetics. This is the last part. It's not so bad. Now, epigenetics. Epi means outside of, and genetics means your genetics, right? So these are things, epigenetics is defined as a herit heritable change in gene expression that occur without a change in the nucle nucleotide sequence of the DNA molecule. So in simple words, it is something that affects your gene expression that is not because of a change in your DNA. Your DNA is the same, but something else is going to affect the expression of your DNA. Okay, um, something outside that is not related to a change in the sequence of your DNA. And it can be inherited, so you can pass it on to your kids. Okay, and these, this is going to be histone acetylation and DNA methylation. Sounds complicated, sounds like it's from, from some other planet, these words, but don't worry, it will make sense. So, you're familiar with this picture. These are the nucleosomes with our DNA wrapped. And I told you before 
that if your DNA, um, if the histones allow for it, the DNA can be free and accessible and it can be transcribed, right? So nucleosomes can regulate our gene expression, right? I said that before. Now, there's a molecule called an acetyl group, and it's going to be this one here, this orange molecule with this pink tail. This molecule can attach to the nucleosomes, and when it does, it stimulates the, the, the histones to change conformation, to change shape, in order to allow DNA to be let free. Okay, so in the presence of these acetyl groups, the histones will... Um, will make DNA more accessible. So acetyl groups make DNA more accessible. So we call that histone acetylation. So in this way, this is called epigenetics because this is something that doesn't change the DNA, but it affects DNA expression because in the presence of this molecule, the DNA could be free and now it can be expressed. So that's why it's called epigenetics. Now, if we look at the next, so, so if this was not here, it would look much different. How would it look like? So without these acetyl groups, it's going to look like this. Look, ignore the green molecules for now. Without these acetyl groups, the nucleosomes will be very tightly wound and the DNA will be inaccessible. They will be so tightly wound and they won't be exposed. Okay? Now, there's another thing called DNA methylation. So remember, the acetyl groups were not attached to the DNA. They were attached to the histones. And that affected, that caused an effect in the histone shape, which caused the DNA to be exposed. Now, Methylation is another molecule, so it's a methyl group now. Instead of an acetyl group being added, we're adding a methyl group. Now, this methyl group adds not to histones, it adds to DNA. Now, when it adds to DNA, it causes inhibition of transcription. I'll show you how it does that. So, here we go. So, there's an enzyme called DNA methyltransferase because it transfers ACE from anything that ends in ACE is an enzyme it transfers methyl onto DNA. So we call it DNA methyltransferase. And this enzyme is gonna add this methyl group where? To the DNA, specifically um, the C, um, um, the C uh, nucleotides, so cytosine, okay? So it's gonna add it to the CG nucleotides. To the cytosine, normally when it's CG, you know how can you can have an order, A, T, C, G, or whatever, right? It will normally add it to the cytosines that are next to a guanine. So CPG is just a way to show that C is attached to G. So it likes to, so this enzyme likes to add this methyl group to a cytosine that is attached to a guanine. All right. Um, and the thing is, there's a lot of cytosines attached to guanine. So we call this a cyto, um, a CPG island. There are a lot of these areas close to the promoter. So if we go back to this, this one here. Um, where is it? So remember the promoter, um, everything attaches there and that will start the gene transcription, right? Now the thing is, methylation, there's a lot of CG groups very close to here. And so when you methylate it, now this whole trans this initiation complex will start reading the DNA and be confused because it will see a lot of these methyl groups and then it will just immediately stop transcribing the gene. So this methylation confuses the initiation complex and makes it think that it's that something's wrong, so it doesn't read it. It doesn't transcribe that gene. Therefore, this um, methyl. Me, um, therefore, doing the DNA methylation will inhibit DNA transcription because it's going to confuse the promoter region, and therefore DNA transcription will not happen. So, two ways: histone acetylation and DNA methylation. Um, let me say it again uh, here with words. DNA methylation, so adding methyl groups to DNA, will inhibit transcription by altering the reading of specific gene near the promoter, right? So now the promoter is confused, so it doesn't transcribe that gene. When you demethylate, that just means to remove the methyl group. That will permit transcription because now we are not altering the reading of the specific gene near a promoter. Now, the next part was histone acetylation. Remember, that's not the DNA. When you, when you uh, add an acetyl group to a histone, you permit transcription by modifying histones to expose the genes, so now they're free and they can be transcribed. When you deacetylate, meaning remove that acetyl group, now you inhibit transcription by modifying histones to hide the genes. Now they're gonna be hidden. Now, so all of this was epigenetics, things that affect gene expression that doesn't affect the order of the original genes itself. It keeps the genes the same, it doesn't affect them, it doesn't rearrange them or anything, but yet it can change the gene expression. Now, what can cause this methylation and acetylation? Many things, pollutants, diet, temperature, stress, 
all of these environmental things like I talked about before. So to end it off, I need to give you one example. This is also very interesting um, to explain epigenetics. So there's a gene. We're going to talk about mice. Okay, why not? Why the hell not talk about mice? So mice, there's this gene called AVY, agouti variable yellow gene. And this gene, when it's expressed, it makes you, it makes, um, it, it causes mice to be yellow and obese and have diabetes. So this is a pretty much a bad gene. Okay. So let me show you. So in a mice that methylation happens. Okay. So let's say there's two mice that have the same exact genes. Let's say there's one mice where there's a lot of methylation. Do you remember what methylation does? Methylation, um, uh, causes, um, uh, these methyl groups to be added to the CPG regions, regions which affects the promoter from trans causing transcription, so the gene is not expressed. Okay, so the so DNA methylation inhibits gene expression. So if we use that logic, uh, um, they basically gave one mouse. So there's two mice. Remember, two mice with the same genes. They gave one mice a lot of methyl. Um, like they a lot of uh, uh, they gave this one mouse a uh, food with a lot of methyl in it, methyl groups in it. So this mice's DNA ended up being methylated, okay? So guess what? Methyl groups to DNA inhibits the gene expression. So this mice didn't express the yellow, didn't express the obese, didn't express diabetes. So this mice was brown and small and healthy. But then this other mice that had this gene, they didn't give it this methyl food. So this, this, this other mice's genes were, um, uh, didn't have any methylation. So what happens was that caused the gene to be active, which means the mouse ended up being yellow. This is not very yellow, I'm sorry. I just don't wanna, didn't wanna give you guys any seizures by making this bright yellow all of a sudden. So when this gene is active because there's no methylation, then uh, this mouse was big, that was obese, yellow, and it had diabetes, okay? So this is kind of an example that was found in science that kind of proves this idea, idea of um, epigenetics, of how your gene expression can be affected by stuff other than your DNA sequence, things like methylation and acetylation. Now here is the actual mice that they use in this experiment. See, there's the obese yellow diabetes one and the normal one. So overall, when I just give you a one minute summary, so we talked about um, uh, how our DNA can be regulated how our transcription can be regulated, how our gene expression can be regulated in two key ways, transcriptional regulation, so the process of regulating transcription, and how post-transcriptional mRNA can be regulated, and finally, how our gene expression can be infected, affected by what? What was it? The environment, and also what epigenetics is, and examples of epigenetics. Now, bear in mind uh, one last thing, because this, this idea, this um, methylation can be inherited, this baby's baby will be healthy and this, one's ba this baby's baby will also have the same problems because it can be in inherited. It doesn't have to be inherited, but it can be. So that's it for this video. I hope it'll be useful. It's a big topic and it's not a nice topic, but I hope I made it as interesting and as easy as possible.